So in the last couple of videos, we talked about some of the properties of the logit model kind of more generally. And now we're going to talk about some of the properties of kind of the, the parameters of the model themselves. And so first I want to talk about variation in preferences. Um, we might think that different decision makers have different preferences and they might vary for, for many reasons. Some that we might be able to observe and some that we might not. So different people might just have different marginal utilities of, for, for different attributes of a good. We were just talking about cars in the last example. Some people want a car that's fast. Some people want a car with a lot of torque. Some people want a car that's, that's fuel efficient. Those are all different kinds of preferences that are gonna affect how people choose which car to purchase. One kind of uh, restriction of the logit model and in particular of the parameters that we're going to estimate. Um, we can kind of think of the parameters as, as, as telling us something about these preferences. Well, the logit model can only explicitly capture variation, uh, taste variation, variation in preferences, variation in parameters, however you want to describe it. Variation in parameters though, let's say. It can only explicitly capture that variation due to observable attributes. And I make this point because future models that we talk about will allow for some unobservable variation in our, in kind of our preferences or our coefficients. But in the logit model, everything has to be, any variation in, in parameters, for example, has to be due to observable attributes. So back to the car bus commute choice, let's think of some possible variation uh, in preferences there. Well, some people hate driving and some people love it. Okay, so you might think that, that there's some parameter that represents preference for driving. But we don't directly observe that preference. And unless we wanna make some assumption that that preference is correlated with some observable demographic information or something, we can't include that variation in the logic model. If that's just completely unobservable preferences, that can't go into our model. But maybe we also think that people with higher incomes care less about the cost. They're just gonna be less sensitive to the cost of, of different alternatives. So for example, we might think that, that instead of having one kind of cost parameter, there's actually a cost parameter beta that we subscript by N because we're saying this, this parameter is gonna vary, it's gonna be different for each decision maker. And in fact, it's gonna be some common beta parameter divided by the decision maker's income. And so we can allow for this kind of parameter or preference variation to enter into our model because it's based on some observable data that we can put into our model. And the way we can do this is really simple. Uh, if we were to plug in, uh, you know, if we were to plug this into our model, it's equivalent to just saying, let's, instead of putting cost into our model, if we think back to, I think when we defined this example, we said M was cost of, of driving, for example. Well, if we divide cost by income, now we're effectively letting the uh, preference for cost to vary with income in this, in this format that we have over here on the left hand side. So as long as we think that these, these parameter differences or preference variations are related to some observable data, we can just directly plug them into our model. But if we're thinking about variation in preferences that's in some way unobservable, we're not going to be able to include that in the logit model. You're going to have to wait for later in the course to get to that. We'll see examples of this when we, when we talk about actual examples at the end of the, you know, in, in class this week also. All right, another aspect here is uh, the scale parameter. We're gonna have to take a, a brief diversion, but away from parameters uh, in some sense, but we'll get back around to why this is, is considered part of kind of our, our estimated logit parameters. So in the logit model, we assume that that unobserved random component of utility has variance pi squared over six. It's kind of a random variance, seemingly, a seemingly obscure number to pick, but it turns out that there's a reason for it. Um, but this assumption 
may seem overly restrictive, right? We're imposing how much utility or how the variance of the utility that, that goes into that unobserved random term. But it turns out we can actually use this scale parameter sigma to allow for different variances. And so let's walk through an example of how this works. Let's suppose that random utility is actually epsilon star that has variance sigma squared times that assumption. So, so, so the variance of, of epsilon star is, is scaled by sigma squared relative to what our model assumes it should be. So now we're gonna write down utility this way. We're gonna have epsilon star on the right-hand side and let's call the ultimate utility on the left-hand side epsilon star also to represent the fact that it's the utility that comes out of having this uh, random utility component with a different variance. Now let's divide this thing by sigma. Okay, well, if we divide by sigma, then we divide our representative utility by sigma. We also divide our epsilon by sigma. We're gonna call the, out, the, the, the result here just u instead of u star, u star. And now the variance of epsilon is exactly what we wanted it to be. It's pi squared. Okay, what does that do for us though? Well, in this scaled model, here, let's flip back real quick. Just note here, now, instead of having representative utility here, we have representative utility divided by sigma. Our assumption about epsilon is right, but now we have this sigma term floating around in the denominator of representative utility. Okay, so when we go to construct choice probabilities, instead of just having representative utility in the exponential, it's gonna be the representative utility divided by this sigma. If we assume that representative utility is, is linear in parameters, we can write that down just like we always have, except still we've got this sigma floating around in a denominator here. And now note one thing about this. The beta stars and the sigmas here are not separately identified. They always show up together. They always show up as beta star divided by sigma. Right? There's nowhere here where just a beta star shows up or just a sigma shows up. They always show up together. So there's no way that we're going to be able to separately identify one. We can only estimate this ratio of them. We can't separately estimate beta star and sigma. We can just estimate this composite beta, which equals beta star divided by sigma. We have to have, you know, they have to show up differently somehow in order for us to think about estimating one versus the other. If they always show up together, there's no, like there's infinitely many possible ways that we could construct. Uh, so instead, we're just gonna be able to estimate this composite beta that is beta star divided by sigma. And so if we plug in beta here, now we've got our standard logit expression. Our, our standard logit uh, choice probabilities. But note, the betas that go into these choice probabilities were our original beta stars divided by sigma, which once again is the square root of the variance, or it's the, uh, yeah, let's pop back here. It, it's the, uh, it's kind of the, the scaling that we're using to adjust the variance of the error term. So we're gonna be able to estimate these betas, but ultimately, if we wanted beta star, we haven't estimated beta star, we've estimated beta star scaled by the sigma parameter. And if this sigma parameter were to change, if it were to get larger, then our estimated betas get smaller and vice versa. If the sigma was to get smaller, our estimated betas would get larger. And so ultimately we're gonna estimate these parameters, these beta parameters, and those estimates are always gonna be relative to the variance of the unobserved utility. It's always gonna be relative to the variance of the unobserved utility. If we had two samples that were otherwise identical, 
but one had more variance in that random unobserved utility term, we're going to get different beta parameters out of them. So sometimes it can be kind of tricky to compare one model to the next. The model is always going to be kind of like internally consistent. But if we think that the variance of the error term is different in two different models, then we kind of can't really compare their parameters to one another because they're only estimated up to that scaling factor. Well, one thing we can do is if we think that different subsets of decision makers have a different variance for that random utility term, then we can estimate that difference. We can essentially use scale parameters to estimate the relative difference in variance between the two, uh, between the two or, or more than two groups of decision makers. So just as an example, uh, we'll, we'll work through how to do this actually in R, uh, but let's just think about a simple example real quick, kind of conceptually. Suppose we have commute data for both Amherst and Boston. There might be a lot of differences between Amherst and Boston, one of which might just be that there's a lot more stuff that gets packed into that epsilon term for one of these towns versus the other. So let's assume that Amherst has scale parameter sigma A, Boston has scale parameter sigma B. We can construct this variable K, which is going to be the, the square of the ratio of them. We can't estimate both sigma A and sigma B in our model, but what we can do is we could estimate a set of parameters for Amherst, which we're gonna call beta, and then we could also estimate this K parameter that tells us how to scale the parameters for Boston relative to the parameters for Amherst. Still at the end of the day, our estimation of the Amherst parameters assumes that the Amherst error uh, random utility variance equals pi squared six or is estimated relative to the scaling of that. But we can at least represent the difference between Amherst and Boston. And we'll work through an example of this together. All right. That's all that I had on kind of properties of Logit. And now we're gonna talk about some of the, the other things we can do with the Logit model or structural models more broadly, which is calculate counterfactuals and welfare. And we'll do that in the next video.